This podcast comes to you from the Pixel Labs Podcast Studio. As the world of marketing evolves, so must brands when faced with new challenges. We help brands grow by identifying opportunities to have real results. Welcome to the Raising Brand Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Raisin Brand Podcast. My name is Aaron. I'm the marketing expert with Raisin Brand. I'm super excited today. We have an awesome online engagement and metaverse guru named Sally Barkman. Sally, nice to have you here. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah, oh my goodness. Awesome. Well, just to kind of give a quick intro before we get into the conversation, Sally Barkman is an online engagement guru with a strong focus in the metaverse and the evolution of the internet. Sally has spent several years working for widely recognized brands such as Gap and Snap Inc., where she elevated awareness on some of the strongest brands in the world today through augmented and virtual reality. Sally is now the owner and founder of Stay In Social. Stay In Social makes bonding online fun by creating opportunities for team building, client appreciation, and community building in the metaverse. Sally, happy to have you. Yeah, so happy to be here. And I'm loving this purple couch and just hanging out in this this very cool immersive space. Yeah, so I think you're far more familiar with this space even than I am. Go ahead and talk <laughs> a little bit about what you're doing uh, with your business and kind of how it relates to the space that we're in currently. Yeah, totally. So I had started um, doing kind of team bonding and and appreciation events on Zoom. Um, a friend of mine was out of work in the bartending industry, and so we just partnered together. And I worked with a lot of my old colleagues on the sales team at Snap to um, help them entertain their clients uh, during the pandemic. And so we started out on Zoom, um, and you know, quickly, you know, people kind of started to feel Zoom fatigue. So I started looking for platforms that um, really kind of just made uh, being online a little bit more fun. I think everybody kind of groaned when they heard about another Zoom happy hour. Um, so that was really how I stumbled upon actually this platform, Oh Yay, um, and was able to very simply just put people into the bars that my bartenders worked at. Um, and so when people hopped into the space, they were just you know smiling ear to ear. It was different. They started playing around with the emojis. Um, moving the drinks around in the scene. Um, and so that was like a really simple way of just testing out a different type of platform that made people have fun right off the bat. Um, and now, you know, the, the platform has evolved over the past two years. There's a lot of different bells and whistles to play with. Um, and so I've just become, you know, kind of an expert creator on the platform um, and now doing kind of like Halloween escape rooms. Um, we did a white elephant last year for Christmas, um, and everything is super interactive, and people can kind of navigate through the spaces. So just a lot of fun, um, and yeah, just socializing on on this space is really fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and great. And 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 I always have a hard time really describing what OEA is. If somebody asks, you know, we really really like the tool here. You know, of course, we have the space that we're sitting in with the chairs and the microphones, mm -hmm. kind of this podcast booth. Um, but it's always tough because you you want to say it's. But you don't. You, you want to say it's like Zoom, you know, because it's a virtual space where you can meet. But it's totally not at the same yeah. time. How would you go about describing OEA? Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, we talk about this all the time with um, a creator community that I'm that I'm a part of. Um, other creators in in OEA, and it is. It's so hard to explain it without showing it. But the way that I usually explain it is Photoshop for streaming. So oh, you know, like if if yeah, and if if listeners are interested in playing around, I would highly um, encourage it. It's super fun and easy to get started. And then you can kind of get as complicated as you want to and learn more and more about the platform. But, um, but you know, that's kind of how I describe it. You can kind of drag and drop images. Um, you can make people feel like they're inside of the space by just manipulating um, your video bubble, for example. Um, so there's really easy ways to just kind of make a space feel like it's almost inside of the computer. Um, but, you know, I think that's kind of scratching the surface um, with some of the other, you know, events that I've done and the escape rooms, for example, it does take more programming. And you really can allow people to navigate around on their own. Um, the other really special thing is that you can have it, it can be always on. Um, so that's kind of where it gets into this sort of new world. Um, and the, the buzzy kind of term that's been being thrown around is the metaverse. And it really does remind me of, a, you know, a metaverse platform because it's not like Zoom where you go into the link for a specific meeting and then leave. 
it's actually something that you can keep live. So the link can be live for anybody to pop in whenever they'd like to. Um, and then there's fun things that you can do where you can, you know, if Raisin Brand doesn't want somebody to go into the podcast room for any reason during a period of time, um, they can lock the door. So it's almost like this sort of uh, physical representation um, of how we act in real life, but it's online. Um, and so it's really, really cool. And you can just imagine like, you know, the, the amount of imagination you can put into a space like this. Um, instead of being in a podcast studio, we could literally be astronauts floating in outer space and recording this, for example. Um, so for creative people, it's just like, it's a playground. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think you um, you started to segue a little bit, and I think I, you, you're going a direction I, I wanted to go in where you talked about kind of the metaverse as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what was interesting in a previous conversation we had, you called uh, this kind of a bridge to the metaverse, you know, where, mm -hmm. you know, people, they, they hear this term metaverse, um, you know, Web3, we talked about that too. These are just big terms that for a lot of folks, it's it's very scary. Um, it's yeah. something that doesn't yeah. really make sense. But I think when you when you use that term bridge to the metaverse, where you can start to visually see, you know, oh, okay, this is maybe, you know, maybe there's a use case here. Maybe there's a way we can utilize this. Can you talk a little bit about what what that means, kind of what the metaverse means or how folks can kind of maybe understand yeah. um, what this looks like and maybe how it can be helpful to them. Yeah, for sure. So I am by no means <laughs> an expert in this very, very new paradigm shift that's going on, but I am wildly interested in it. So, um, you know, as a curious person, I've just been poking around and talking to anybody that will chat with me. So my, you know, the biggest thing that I would say is that nobody really knows right? Like this is all evolving at once. And so um, in terms of the intimidation factor, I totally get it, but it's such a friendly place. And, and there's so many creative and smart people that are getting into it um, that I would just encourage everybody to start learning and start diving in. And this podcast this is a great place to start. So first and foremost, I would say that um, just start reading and talking to people. And then secondly, you know, I think what's really interesting about um, the way that I see the metaverse, and again, lots of different definitions flying around right now, but the way that I see it is just kind of the evolution of how we're all connecting online. So, you know, way back when um, I was, you know, much younger, um, AOL Instant Messenger, you probably don't even know what that is, Aaron. <laughs> um, but that was, you know, the first way that we, that I started to talk to my friends online. Um, and, and I would literally call them on the phone and be like, do you want to go on Instant Messenger and chat with me right now? It was, it was that level. Um, so that's kind of where my familiarity and where I started as a younger person interacting with people online. Um, and then, you know, over the years, it's evolved a lot. So we have Slack now where we, where we chat with people. We have um, Zoom where we have an actual video chat um, and can actually see each other. And that's evolved the way that we work, that we, um, you know, connect with family, especially through the pandemic and friends. Um, and now, you know, I think the pandemic really sped up this idea of, oh, wait, we don't need to be in the same place to connect. Um, um, I know I caught up with people that I hadn't talked to in 15 years. Um, and so there's this newfound sort of like appreciation for keeping those relationships alive and, you know, continuing to, to um, you know, nurture those relationships, even if you're not in the same place. Um, and with that, I think, you know, Zoom is a great application for all things corporate, right? And if you just need to communicate with, with somebody, um, it's great. You know, it does the trick. But I think what people were feeling is, okay, well, you know, I, I'm on this every single day at work, all day. Um, so now these kind of, like you said, these sort of like bridge metaverse platforms that aren't necessarily 3D avatars walking around, right? Like you and I are on these couches feels like we're on these couches, but it's our video bubbles. So we still have that sort of familiar um, way of connecting and seeing each other's faces. It feels human. Um, so that's kind of where I see this. That's kind of how I define these like bridge metaverse platforms. They still have this sort of human element with the video um, feed coming in. So you still have that familiarity, but it still is a little bit more immersive and, and sensory, I would say, is the biggest thing. Um, 
um, that makes it different than Zoom. And then what makes it kind of this bridge into the metaverse is that persistence. So it's always on, you can pop in, um, you could, you know, create a space that, you know, if you're in here just working and I wanted to, you know, have a coworker to work with, I could pop in and just say, hey, Aaron, and, you know, we don't even work at the same company, but I have the access to the Raisin Brand Lounge, so I can do that. Um, and that's what makes it that sort of like bridge to the metaverse. It's it's that persistency. Um, and then in addition, this sort of feeling of being able to almost be like inside the computer. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and one takeaway you know, with, with all the stuff that you're saying is it's almost like we've been practicing for this f- for some time, you know, mm-hmm. and I think that's the biggest takeaway is, again, just some of these big words, you know, metaverse, Web3, yeah. crypto, NFTs, all that stuff. Um, it is new and we're not quite sure where it's going, but really there's a lot of things that we've been doing for a number of years that have kind of led us to some of these places. So it's not maybe as foreign as some people really think. Um, it's just becoming more immersive. And I, and I love that, that just that additional step, you know, where it feels like we're in the room. It feels like we're having a conversation. And um, that's where OEA is interesting. You know, this is how we chose to set up this room, but I'm sure you could look at it and then think of it a whole different way. Um, so what are, some, what are some places that you have um, found very valuable as you've been looking more into, you know, this idea of the evolution of the internet. Um, I know that you're very interested in NFTs. You know, where mm-hmm. can people go to learn more about this stuff? What are some of those really good resources? Yeah, definitely. So I think um, just to continue talking about the different metaverse platforms. Um, so this one, again, I would say is like a bridge. It's very easy to access, um, to build in. Um, people pop in and they don't feel like it's super foreign. So I think OEA is a great place to kind of like just sign up for an account and start poking around, start making your own rooms, um, start using some of their, there's there's also creators that have created different spaces that you can, that are pre-built, you can just pop into um, and use yourself when you're hanging out with friends, things like that, just to get familiar. It's a great place to start. Um, and then I am also super interested in the, you know, the 3D version of the metaverse as well. And, and you know, Meta, for example, that used to be Facebook, you can access their uh, metaverse with VR glasses and goggles. Um, so there's a lot, you know, happening with the innovation um, on that side as well. But it might be a little bit, you know, it might be like a little weird to, to hop into those spaces and be around other avatars. Um, so, you know, depending on where you're at and what you're interested in. And um, you can kind of explore different different types of metaverses depending on your comfort. Um, but the other really great great way, especially for brands, to start brainstorming and just kind of keeping their pulse on what's happening um, is just to sign up for newsletters. So, and I'm happy to kind of like send you a list um, that you can share over email as well. But yeah. There's a couple of brands that are just testing in lots of different ways in the metaverse. So um, one of the platforms that is a public 3D version of a metaverse is called Decentraland. And um, that one's a really cool place to pop in. They've been testing a lot with big brands. I just went into a space. um, It was a game that I think Heineken built. Uh, So there's there's ways to kind of start seeing what brands are doing now uh, by just exploring. Um, so Decentraland's a good newsletter to sign up for. They always let you know when there's branded events happening. I think Honda even released a car, unveiled a car oh, on wow. their platform. Yeah, really cool stuff. Um, Nike has a complete metaverse in, in Roblox, which whoever has kids, you might know that your kids are, you know, sometimes playing in um, Fortnite and Roblox. Those are both versions of the metaverse that you can build in. Um, again, just a very a different audience, right? They're they're younger. Um, what other one? And then, you know, exploring Meta too. I think they're going to be doing really cool things with VR, and um, obviously, they're going to have a huge audience um, on their platform. Just you know, being Facebook. Um, so those are really great ways to just see what brands are doing in these different types of metaverses. Um, and then in terms of NFTs, we pro- we might have uh, uh, wanted to talk about these in reverse order. So I'm going to backtrack a tiny <laughs> bit. Um, but, but the thing about NFTs that are so interesting is I think originally when they first came onto the scene, it was like, oh, there's this way to make a lot of money, right? You heard about the crypto kitties, you heard about Bored Ape. Um, and it was like this kind of like feeling that there was this gold rush to 
pick the right NFT project. Um, but then a lot of times people invested in an NFT project and then they, you know, didn't make any money or they lost a lot of money. So there was, there's kind of these like really, um, you know, fairy tale to like, you know, um, awful stories about what happens when you invest in NFTs. And I think now that that kind of story is, it's still prevalent, but people are just more like interested in the idea of an NFT and it's becoming more mainstream that I'm hoping that this feeling of like, oh, I have to buy something to make a lot of money will die down. And I think it is. And the interest around, oh, what could NFTs unlock, right? So for a brand, you know, experimenting with NFTs is is an amazing place to kind of be uh, exploring right now. Um, you don't necessarily have to make an NFT to test out sort of like how this could affect your brand. So for example, um, you know, I think that NFTs will become more of a utility. And what I mean by that is like, for example, if Nike um, drops an NFT to, to let's say um, they're, you know, I don't know, 1,000 super fans who every single year buy the new Jordans, let's say, um, and they want to say like, hey, you guys have invested in us every single year and we really appreciate you. We appreciate that. We're going to drop you an exclusive NFT that only this thousand, these thousand people have and it's going to unlock different things for you. So you're going to be able to go to our Roblox Nike town and be able to access, you know, a few games that nobody else is going to be able to access. So it kind of could work as this sort of like loyalty program um, that unlocks like these really cool experiences experiences in real life, of course, but then also thinking about the metaverse, you know, they, anybody from anywhere could access those games on Roblox, for example. Um, so I think the, the evolution of the NFT will become more and more of like, how can brands use this as a utility to say like, thanks for investing in us. Now we want to invest in you. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so for those who maybe don't know, when you're talking about NFTs, um, you know, I think a lot of people have seen like the pictures, you know, they, they've seen yeah. these different drawings. So talk a little bit about how, um, you know, when say you said that Nike was going to be dropping these NFTs for those super fans. Um, is that just a picture? What all comes with that? Or how does somebody get access to yeah. that? Yeah. So it, it's, there's a couple of different ways to think about different NFTs and different ways that they can come to life. I think the most popular one that got the most attention is um, these computer generated uh, NFT projects that had like 10,000 NFTs in one project. So a good example of that is like a CryptoKitty or a Bored Ape. Um, and those started to be considered uh, PFPs um profile pictures mm -hmm. so basically what that meant is like it was almost like this this badge of like credibility or clout like if you have a bored ape and you put that a lot of people might have seen people um changing their twitter profile pictures to be their nft and the reason for that is because one, it gave them credibility, right? It's like, I have this NFT, I'm part of this club, um, I got in, right? Like I invested in this awesome NFT project. But the second part of that and what, you know, I think is happening more and more now with these profile pictures is that it becomes your identity. So it's really interesting because um, they're just these, right? They're just these like JPEGs. <laughs> <laughs> and like some of them are like cartoons that you know you looks like you maybe your kid could do um and people are like how are these selling for so much money but the idea behind it is that you're part of the club you have the clout and then the third thing is it's your identity so you know um being a bored ape and and having you know, there's different kind of like characteristics to each each one of them. So they look very similar, but maybe one has a red cap on and I'm making it up as like smoking a cigarette. Um, people, when they look at that and they buy it, they want they want that to be part like a reflection of who they are in their personality mm -hmm. and their vibe. Right. Like vibe is a huge word that's being thrown around everywhere. So that's like that's I think that was where the hype came from because it was like so unbelievable that people would pay so much but there's this deep 
deeper kind of meaning to, to owning an NFT like that. Um, and it's much more about like being, in, being included and being part of this specific club, um, depending on what that club, what that club's vibe is, right? Like for me, for example, I decided to get a sad girl NFT. And I looked through all of the NFTs um, and picked one that had long blonde hair and she has sunglasses on and she's holding a wine glass. I love wine. I have blonde hair. Um, and she just kind of looked cool to me. And I was like, great, that's the one I'm going to, that's what I'm going to get. Um, but the, but the bigger draw to me was actually that the community was full of artists and, oh. and I'm an artist. And so that's why I wanted to get that NFT. So now I'm part of the discord. I get to chat with people. Um, there's like a drawing club every, every month. So it's kind of like being part of being part of that club as part of my identity. So hopefully that demystifies a little bit of like the, why would somebody pay so much for an NF the, a JPEG? Um, and that's part of it. And then I think where brands come in is I do think that there was a lot of hype around it. I think, you know, there were some brands that sort of just like created NFTs to create NFTs. Um, but if we've learned anything about what happens with that profile picture, for example, it's the community that matters the most. And so when brands just sort of launch an NFT and they don't they don't cultivate the community or really like have any utility behind the NFT, um, it could sort of falls flat uh, because people that's what people are looking for. They're looking to be part of the you know exclusive club that loves Jordans, right? Um, and and I don't think it matters as much like what the NFT looks like. It's being part of that club and and having it. I'll pause there, but I can also go into like the mechanics very simply, um, like how to get an NFT and um, what you would need for for most NFTs. Yeah, no, and 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 that's up to you. I know that there's probably some tutorials out there that that yeah. folks could reference, and and I don't want to have you going into the basics when somebody else can do that. I I, <laughs> I appreciate what you shared, um, but no, I, and I think the last part that you that you hang on that you hung on to for a second there is really really important. It's just how niche niche do you what? How do you say it? Yeah, niche. I say niche, but I don't know if it is niche. <laughs> I think I feel like I go back and forth and just judge, you know, based on the person's reaction if I said it the right way or not. Totally. But cool. Okay, we're good. Um, but I think there's a lot of value in that. And you know, one thing for me, and this was before even any of these terms were out, but how I got into marketing was um, editing call, uh, editing gaming videos, making montages of oh, gaming. Cool. Um, and how I got into it was created a YouTube channel, did that. But then the 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 coolest part, my favorite part, was then I was able to meet other people all over the globe that enjoyed exactly that, you know, because nobody in my friend group, school, family at all would ever care about anything like that. Um, and so I don't know if you have any recommendations, but one that uh, that I think is really important is before you try to, you know, make this for your brand or really have it become from your brand, explore it personally first, because I think then that's where you'll yeah. really see the value in it. Because of just like you said with... Um, with your NFT, you know, being able to connect with that community because it's very important to you. Um, it gave you specific value that somebody else probably would look at and be like, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Why would yes. anybody ever buy that? Um, so there was a lot of value in the stuff that you just shared. I just thought it'd be really good to capture that. So thank you. I thought that, that, that was really great. So awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, is there anything else before we wrap up today's podcast that you'd just like to share? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing is just like, totally get that that web three in the metaverse is intimidating i would say like it's so new that nobody really knows anything so no stupid questions um mm -hmm. if somebody does make you feel bad about asking a question then that's not the right person to talk to um i would lo i love brainstorming about this stuff so i'm always happy to jump on the phone and just talk about um things that might be confusing or brainstorm about ideas for for brands but um, but yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in this space. I don't think it's going away. Um, it's not just a buzz thing, um, but it's going to take a little bit of time to get everybody acclimated to this new way of, of communicating and meeting online. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Sally, thank you so much for joining us today. This was very valuable. And I think that you helped um, kind of break down the barriers a little bit to some of this stuff and, and help folks realize that, hey, you know, I've already been using some of these tools, you know, maybe in a very kind of um, a low level way, but you know, it is steps to kind of this bigger picture. And I think that that's, that's really valuable. So thank you so much. 
Awesome. awesome. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you everybody for tuning in to this episode of the Raisin Brand Podcast. Of course, you can check out other episodes on YouTube and Spotify. But again, thank you everybody for tuning in and I hope you have a really good day. Bye.